back on the podcast with Calais Campbell, uh, the defensive end of the Baltimore Ravens. And Calais, I, I really want to start by uh, by talking a little bit about how do you still play at a high level when you're age 35? And I think more and more we're seeing in football, obviously it's headlined by Tom Brady continuing to kill people when he's 44. Um, but I just wonder when you look at your career, your age, how do you keep it up at a high level at age 35? Well, I mean, uh, <laughs> I spent a lot of time and uh, resources on taking care of my body. You know, uh, I mean, my wife gets a little, uh, sometimes I have, to, I have to give her a good date night because uh, pretty much every day I'm doing, you know, working with different people, doing, uh, you know, active, active release therapy, um, you know, get massages, dry needling, acupuncture, you know, just going through the whole shebang of ways to try to feel as good as I can feel so I can get, you know, to Sunday and feel great. And it's a process, you know, it takes a lot of time, but um, I love, I love the game. So, uh, you know, I, I make all the sacrifices, you know, um, and uh, do all I can so I can go out there and, and ball out. Can you give me an example of what the day after a game is like for you? Give me an idea from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, what do you do to take care of yourself? Yeah, uh, well, I try to sleep as long as possible after the game. So, so sometimes it's hard to. Um, <clears throat> and this year we had, we have a lot more. We had a lot more night games than other years. So some of those games you're getting home so late that you just try to sleep as long as possible. Uh, but um, first thing I do is um, I have um, a guy that comes in and works on my body, and just uh, kind of whatever nicks and bruises that popped up, we just kind of work through and just kind of um, do like uh, some kind of um, physical therapy for whatever injury I have. And then I usually do uh dry you do needle. that in, in your house? Yeah, in my house, yes. I have, okay. uh, come through. I have like a room downstairs that's like a recovery room, um, you know, with a table and all that stuff set up. So uh, when people come in, we can work. You know, I have all the tools that, you know, people need. So sometimes I have people come from out of town, um, you know, that are specialists that I've dealt with in years past and people I've worked with for years. That way uh, they, they know my body. They know how I'm supposed to feel. So it's not like somebody trying to get used to you again. And, um, you know, uh, just making sure that uh, everything is firing and moving the way it's supposed to. Uh, then I get a, you know, usually like a three hour massage. Um, you know, I soak in some Epsom salt and then I usually uh, soak in the cold tub um, for another, you know, usually about 20 minutes each for both of those. Um, usually get in the sauna, try to sweat out all those bad toxins and stuff. Uh, and then just make sure I'm eating real good and just like, re like putting in a lot of good fluids and electrolytes in my system. Um, but everything's calculated, you know, uh, it's, it's a process. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy because every week is the exact same week. The, the routine does not change based off. I mean, sometimes with, uh, uh, you know, Monday night game, Thursday night game, it changes a little bit, but the variation is the same uh, for every normal week. And so um, it's, a, it's a process, but, uh, you know, it's, it's working. And, you know, it's been good for me my whole career. Last year was the only year I didn't have to, my, my, my setup. Uh, during the COVID year, and that uh, that definitely took a toll on me. That, that year was very tough. But did um, you test positive for COVID last year? I did. Yeah, I did. and you missed you missed four games because of it, or what happened? Yeah, I missed four games. Uh, but how how well, bad did it hit you? Well, but but I also had a calf injury too, so it wasn't oh, just did. COVID. So COVID hit me hard, but uh, it only hit me hard for about like six, uh, about five or six days. And then once I recovered, I felt it, but it wasn't enough to keep me from playing. Uh, I also, um, it was uh, the calf injury, but I think also COVID, because I got COVID while I, while I had an injury, and I think it made, it made it took me a lot longer to heal because of that. Uh, but it was just a unique year, man. It, it was tough, you know, uh, uh, late in the season. But once I once I got to the playoffs, I finally felt like myself again, and uh, you know, and we gave it our best shot. You know, it's crazy because you know the ultimate goal was to win the Super Bowl, and we got felt like we were in a good position, and just you know didn't go away. Um, I wonder when you when you got COVID and you were suffering with it, did you sort of understand what all the fuss was about? And what everybody was talking about with COVID, did it hit you that hard? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> when I got it, I was like, man, like, um, you know, the first day I didn't really feel as much until like late. And then like when it hit me, it hit me hard. And I, I was like, man, I, I hope nobody has to go through this because like, I mean, it was the worst sickness I've ever had. 
you know, um, I mean, the only time I really felt worse is when my, my, I had appendicitis, my, my appendix burst. And um, and th that was the only time I could really feel like I felt worse in my life. But, you know, that was the most circus, sickness I ever had. How long did, how long did it last? Uh, with, with COVID, uh, it was pretty much like where it was the worst, like, sickness I ever had for five days. Like, you know how when you're, like, sick, you could just watch TV, listen to some music or whatever, you just kick back, you try to, you know, like, I couldn't even watch TV. It hurt so bad. I couldn't, you know, I, I didn't want to just try to sleep as much as possible and uh, load up on, like, the, you know, the, the, the drugs, uh, the prescription meds they gave us uh, that, uh, that, that tried to help with some of that. But even then, it really was just like, man, just try to sleep, sleep through the pain. Did you have any problems with your heart, with myocarditis, which some people, especially some athletes, have had? No, when, when we got back, we did all the testing um, and my tests were, were pretty good. Uh, you know, I did have asthma. I do have asthma. So I was worried about, uh, you know, some having some issues in my lungs and in my heart uh, with inflammation in that area. Uh, but uh, during that process, uh, I was monitoring, I was uh, monitored and uh, I was able to, you know, uh, just I, that wasn't too bad. It was really just uh, uh, the, the aching and the pain, but my heart and everything was fine. So. The other thing that really I think is kind of interesting about your career, especially recently, is that after the 2019 season, you had a very good year with Jacksonville. You were the top rated 3-4 uh, defensive end in the league. And even though you were, whatever, 33 years old. And I found it really, really interesting that the Jaguars at that time chose to trade you to Baltimore. And I have many questions about this, but what really interests me a lot about the trade is that you were traded for a fifth round draft choice, okay, after having the season that you had. And that fifth round draft choice ended up becoming a safety, uh, for Jacksonville. It was the 157th pick in the draft. Guy's name is Daniel Thomas. And in the first five weeks of this season, I think, Daniel Thomas played one snap for the Jacksonville Jaguars. And I, I, first of all, I'm just curious. When you heard about the trade, did you think to yourself, a fifth round pick, that's all I'm worth? <laughs> what went through your mind? Yeah, um, I, uh, I I mean, I'm, I'm a student of the game, and so I know that, you know, players over 30 don't usually get traded for much more than, you know, fourth, fifth round pick, um, you know, too often. And so, like, I guess I figured that was going to be the case uh, when, it, when, it, when it came through, but I was uh, kind of feeling like, man, I feel like, I'm, I feel like if you can get, a, if you can draft a guy today, uh, you know, in the fifth round, you know, I feel like, you know, 99% of the time, I'm probably going to be a better player than for the first, you know, next three, four years, in my opinion, uh, maybe even longer uh, you know, in that moment while I was thinking. And so I feel like, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I feel like even first round pick, you know, I feel like I, I can outplay a first round pick, you know, majority of the time, a high majority of the time. And so I feel like, uh, you know, anytime you get traded and you realize that, you know, it's for a fifth round pick, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's humbling, you know, I would say humbling. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, it's just the nature of the business. The future, uh, you know, is is always the, the main goal. And, you know, there are some great players that come in the fifth round. You know, you get, you know, Hall of Fame type players in the fifth round, you know, it's just you know, if, if you draft right. So, you know, uh, I guess the, the potential of it is always what makes it worth it. But I definitely felt a certain kind of way, just naturally. Um, but I know that's the nature of the business. Did you uh, did you request a trade, or did it come oh. out of left field? Yeah, I was surprised. Um, you know, um, you know, I mean, outside world. You know, I feel like they talk about trading me pretty much every year, cutting me every year. Uh, I was there, <clears throat> but internally, they've always told me they like me. Uh, you know that uh, they, you know, that we have a. You know, I mean, we even talked about a, a extension a couple times. Um, and our, after like year year one and year two, talking about maybe at the end of this deal, we might be able to, you know, keep you here longer. Uh, so I was kind of surprised by it. But at the same time, um, you know, it was one of those things where I felt like, uh, you know, uh, Dave Codwell, who was a GM at the time, when he called me, he was pretty much saying like, hey, sir, we're getting offers on you from a lot of people. Uh, and where we're at right now and uh, where you're at, we feel like it makes sense for us to trade you. Um, he said, I think it'd be good for both of us. And he said that, um, 
uh, that uh, uh, Baltimore is the team that we agreed to trade you to right now. I said, but if it's not Baltimore, uh, it will be somebody else because Baltimore wanted to do a contingent on a, a deal being done, reworking my contract. And so uh, he said, if it's not Baltimore, it will be somebody else. Uh, but we'll give you uh, three days to work out a deal with Baltimore. And then um, um, after, after that, you, you know, if it works out great, if not, then, uh, you know, it'll be somebody else. It's like, okay. you, know what I, you know what I really remember about you in Jacksonville? In 2019, I was in the Jaguars training camp and you saw me there and you brought Josh Allen over, the young pass rusher, obviously the seventh pick in the draft. And you brought him over to introduce him to me to basically say, hey, this guy's going to be good in this league for a long time. You should get to know him. And I always thought, I always think of like a mentor type guy, which is what you were to Josh Allen. How did you get to feel that way? And how did you get to play that role? Uh, well, I think, uh, I mean, I grew up with five brothers. So, so I think it's kind of just uh, naturally in me, like where my br like brothers were, you know, I mean, I've had so much help from my brothers and, uh, you know, my younger brothers giving all my knowledge and sharing information. That's kind of how we are. And then uh, when I was young in the league, you know, I had Larry Fitzgerald, um, you know, and a bunch of other guys too that helped along the way. But Larry probably the most. Um, you know, who was able to kind of, you know, kind of you know, pull me aside and, you know, and, and give me some reassurance, tell me I'm doing things the right way, you know, kind of give me some advice on some other things I can do better. And, uh, you know, he's just a big brother when it came to stuff outside of football and even in football too, on just the, the work ethic and things I need to do, taking care of my body, stuff like that. And so, I mean, you know, when you're young, you just don't know, you know, and you have to kind of be exposed to a, a way of life to, you know, have longevity in this, in this, in this game. And so, um, you know, I, I think after all the knowledge I accumulated over the years, I feel like it would be an injustice to the game and, and just uh, to the people around me if I didn't share that. So, you know, I take great pride, always have, you know, even when I was in Arizona as a, you know, my seventh, eighth and ninth year, you know, I started kind of really trying to become that uh, big brother to a lot of the young players that I saw that had real potential. Uh, you know, I would give everybody advice, but especially the ones I saw that had real, real potential. And um, and it just kind of carried over the rest, the rest of my career. I mean, I mean, I, I take great pride in really helping the young guys keep the game strong. As uh, as they used to tell me back in the day, you know, you know, uh, I'm protecting the pension, protecting my pension. You know, the, the old players used to give me knowledge. So I got to protect the pension, man. I got to keep you good so the game is strong. If you left one thing with Josh Allen for his future, tell me what it was. Man. Uh, well, that's tough because uh, there's so many different things I feel like we talked through. And, uh, you know, uh, I mean, when it comes to like football, I, you know, I try to make sure he understood because, you know, sometimes when you're gifted like he is, you know, he can, you know, the players can kind of relax and get comfortable, you know. And I think, um, you know, one of the things I really tried to make sure he understood is, is that like for order for anybody to be the very best, you got to outwork everybody else in the league. So however hard, you know, Miles Garrett's working, however hard, you know, all the great players that play his position are working, Joey Bosa, you know, all the great players that play his position, you know, the Von Millers, it's like, you got to outwork them. You, you got to make sure whatever you're doing off season, during the season, watching tape, preparing for a game, you know, because hard work's the only way. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's just from a football perspective, I think is, is probably the number one, you know, rule of thumb when it comes to trying to be a great player in this league is, you know, I mean, you could be as talented as ever, but tell them to get you so far. It's gotta be, you gotta be the hardest working person. And I feel like that's what really when my career took off, you know, um, when I was in, uh, I think it was year seven, you know, and I was frustrated. I was like, I never made a Pro Bowl. I feel like I was worthy of Pro Bowls and I didn't get one yet. I was, I think in year six, I was um, uh, uh, alternate. And alternate, then I started, yeah. yeah. And then I started thinking to myself like, but are you really putting your all into this? You know, and I worked hard. I was definitely a hard worker. But then it was just like, you know, I, I elevated my game to say, OK, I want to make sure I'm outworking the J.J. Watts, you know, and, uh, you know, the other good players in the league. And I knew that I was like, OK, I don't know what they do in the workout. I have talked to, you know, over the years, we, you know, be, you become friends. You start talking to them, getting a feel for what they do working out wise. Uh, but, you know, I don't know what they're doing working out wise, but I'm going to push myself to the level where, you know, they can either be equal to me or less to me. They can't be more. And so that was the message I kind of sent to all the guys, you know, Josh Allen and then uh, the, the kid Odafe we got here. Um, you know, it's just uh, the hardest working person in the building is the one who gets to, you know, to be the guy. And, you know, everybody wants to be the guy. So, but on top of that, man, just, uh, you know, just, and, and then, you know, 
I mean, the basic, you know, family stuff, you know, you know, I feel like sometimes in this world, uh, you know, uh, you know, you get into this position and you had to You know, growing up, you know, you got to absorb all your family's problems. You know, everybody comes to you when they have an issue. And I was like, man, just, you know, uh, you know, try to find somebody you could depend on, you know, that can, can be a guy who can help you help other people. Um, but you definitely got to bring people along, but it's a balance, you know, just making sure that you don't let all their stresses pull mm -hmm. you down, stuff like that. But I mean, there's probably a lot of things I can go through, but, uh, yeah. you know, there's a couple. Calais, tell me, um, you know, most people who will listen to this have never had an instance in their life where they're very, very good at their job. And somebody picks up the phone one day and calls that person and says, oh, by the way, you have been traded from your company and you have no say in where you're going, but you now are going to live and do your job in Baltimore, Maryland. What is it like really to get traded and not really have any control over what is going on in your life? <laughs> yeah, it is unique. It is unique. I mean, you're, you know, you're making plans. You have all this stuff set up, you know, from just preparation for the year. And then, uh, you know, you get a call and you got to drop everything and create new plans and pick up and leave. And, you know, you marry, you know, kid and, and you're like okay you know uh you know whatever you had planned baby we got to change it you know it's, it's kind of tough uh, uh but um you know but it can, but also can be a blessing you know and you know in this particular case you know I, I ended up in a great place where I feel very comfortable uh very welcome my wife loves Baltimore um you know place we're at she uh you know um I mean, takes the kid around in the park and everything else, and she can just tell she's very happy. So it is, it worked out very well for us. Uh, but to, to, you know, to have to go through, you know, a process where everything changes in an instant and, you know, pretty much, you know, having to move all your stuff, everything you own in that city, you know, I mean, I still got a storage unit in, in Jacksonville that has not been uh, shipped yet. <laughs> Because it's just like, you know, you just don't, you don't even know where you're going. Like, well, I came to Baltimore, I had to find a place to live, you know, uh, yeah. you know, and so there was nothing set up yet. And when I finally did, it was just a whole process. But um, it is definitely a, a challenge. But, yeah. um, you know, like anything else, you just kind of, you know, make the best of it. And no matter what you can't, control, things you can't control, you just, you, you know, you accept and then uh, things you can't control, you make the best of. So I want to ask you two things about the Ravens. Number one. If I were a defensive player, I think I would really love to play in Baltimore because the tradition is so strong. The, uh, there's this no excuse mentality that kind of was you know, started by Ray Lewis, Ed Reed. And I wonder, you've now been on three teams and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what is different about Baltimore versus other teams you've been on and specifically what is different about the defense? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, every place is special, you know, I feel like uh, you always kind of just, I mean, no matter where you're at playing football is a dream come true. And uh, you know, and it's, I mean, opportunity to live out this dream, you know, you're going to have fun doing it. Um, you know, one of the coolest things about Baltimore, I feel like, is that everybody here gets treated the same, no matter if you're an undrafted free agent, uh, first round pick, you know, the staff, everybody in the building, you know, uh, treats you the same. And then there's enthusiasm amongst the, uh, across the whole building. Everybody does a job at a high level, you know, from the people in the kitchen, the people upstairs, uh, you know, all the people around you that help you. You know, I feel like there's a true passion and enthusiasm that uh, is, uh, is definitely, uh, you know, nice to see. And, uh, you know, there's people everywhere else I've been that are great people, but it just seems like the leadership here, uh, the, the way they carry themselves is, is definitely unique and special. And then um, from a standpoint of, of from, from our defense, uh, you know, uh, I mean, one thing I, they always say here that I've always appreciated, though, is we're going to lead the team in effort. And we're going to lead the leading effort. You know, uh, you, you know, all the stuff with, the, you know, talent and X's and O's and all that stuff, we're going to also be good at. Uh, but effort is something that's between you and you. You only know if you're going or hard you can go. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, 
we're going to lead the leading effort. And then it comes down to, you know, uh, I think there's a high level of, uh, of, of, of uh, game planning where we really figure out how can we put everybody in the best position to be successful, what we have. And I think they do a really good job of bringing in the kind of guys who uh, are like coordinators. I mean, we have probably like seven, eight guys on our defense right now who could go and be defensive coordinators when they're done playing, um, you know, and maybe even more, you know, that's just what I see so far, you know, and uh, just they take the kind of guys who are really, really intelligent and can learn on the fly so we can do a lot of stuff. but. And then, uh, like I like a guy like Pernell McPhee, who was uh, who was here um, during the, the last championship, last Super Bowl that uh, the, the, the Baltimore has won. And uh, you know, I always talk to him about how Ray Lewis was, and uh, Ed Reed, and uh, Suggs, and just the guys that came before him. And uh, you know, he kind of just he's he's kind of the guy who's the enforcer and establishes like that that bond, that brotherhood. You know that you know. I mean, and and you know, with with uh, last year with COVID being the case, it was kind of hard because like this team is so much built on the camaraderie, getting together outside of the building, having that brotherhood, that bond, and watching tape together, talking through things uh, together, but also just talking life and everything else. You know, and putting that. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, as Pernell McPhee would say, uh, just you know, you gotta love each other. You know. You gotta have that that strong, you know. Like I would do anything for you for, for the man next to me, and you know I feel like every team tries to have that. That's just the way it's, you know. That's the NFL camaraderie, you know, to, will take you a lot further in the game. But I feel like they do a really good job here of uh, of really just giving you the the like the time and uh, the resources to really come together and bond and uh, and create that, that 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 foundation you need to sacrifice for the man next to you. I want to ask you about something that happened in week five. Um, and a lot of people sort of view special teams as sort of the chaos of football. And I want to find out basically how chaotic it is and how much it's planned because basically, and, and just for, for people who forget this or, or didn't see it, Indianapolis led you guys 25 to 17 with uh, four minutes and 37 seconds left in the game and Indianapolis lined up for a 37 yard field goal. And normally that's basically almost today, just like an extra point. So very good chance that that field goal is going to be made. If that field goal is made, you're not winning the game. You're going to be behind by 11 points four and a half minutes to go, even if you get the ball twice, um, it, very unlikely that you're going to be able to come back and win. So I want you to take me into that play. And I want you to tell me how it was that you were able to block that field goal. And, and maybe more than that, what does it take to be able to do something like that, just in terms of planning and scheming? Yeah. I feel like it's really two parts to it. It's the planning, the scheme, and then it's just the emotional uh, intensity of the moment. And like, um, you know, I feel like uh, in in those moments where everything's on the line, I feel like it brings the best out of you. Always has, you know, uh, uh, for me and really for our whole team. And uh, I feel like uh, I truly believed uh, that if if that kick was blocked, that you know, that we had Lamar that was gonna go down there and he was gonna score score a touchdown, get the two-point conversion, we're going to win the ball game. And so um, earlier, you know, uh, some of the uh, field goal tries, we had uh, done some different things and I feel like we were real close to blocking it. So I knew that there was a chance. And then, um, you know, uh, in, earlier in the week, we had uh, made a change. We put uh, Broderick Washington at the Sam position, which is really outside linebacker position. Usually the guys like, you know, 260, maybe 270 playing that position, but we put somebody who's 310, 315 pounds in that position who has a great get off and uh, just try to create some more space because you need a little space. I don't care how gifted you are, you know, you need space. And so Broderick uh, did a really good job of knocking back that, that tight end. Uh, so it made it easier for, for me to step through. And then um, we had, uh, you know, uh, I guess you could call it like a bluff, but we kind of made an inside move with the with our with our uh, tackle or three technique. So I made the kind of guard go down. He was expecting to get because earlier in the game we had uh, we I mean just double team shoulder to shoulder. 
um, you know, two on one, knock the guard back. And so when he, you know, when we're in that press situation, he's worried about getting knocked back again because we almost knocked him back and blocked it before. So this time, you know, he makes an inside move and he's leaning, leaning hard. So he ends up falling down, which gave me a little more crease. And I was able to get through, get my feet down. And like, you know, I, I blocked a lot of kicks in the day, but it's been it was seven years since I blocked a kick. And I'm sitting to myself like, man, I know I'm still good at blocking kicks. It's been a while, but I, I know I could block one. And, you know, in that seven years, I got really close to blocking a few you know, where I could feel the wind of the ball go by my hand, which is the worst because, you know, like it was literally an inch, inch away. Uh, but um, when, uh, when in this situation earlier in the, you know, against, um, earlier in the year against uh, the Oakland or the Las Vegas Raiders, uh, I, that's when I felt the win of a ball that would have won that would have won us the game when they tied it up to go to overtime. And I'm like, man, like, and I just I remember talking to this our special coach Chris Horton, and he was saying that um, he was like, man, it's okay, you'll get another opportunity, and we're gonna put we're gonna do some stuff to give you better opportunity to get you know, to make that play. And so then he made the adjustment to put uh, Roger Washington at, at Sam. You know, we did some stuff where we drew up some stuff on the inside to kind of give us a little more space in there. And uh, it felt good to go in there and get in that moment and get my, you know, get my feet through, get my hands up. And I mean, once I got the ball fast enough, I knew I was blocking it. I mean, you just, once you get the, the way I got the ball and I got back there, I mean, I knew I was blocking it. At that point in time, I was like, can I pick it up and go score? You know, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, those, those days are probably long gone where I could scoop and score, uh, but it felt good to get the block and give my, give my team a chance to, to win. Calais Campbell, really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks so much. And uh, continued success. And um, hope you play till uh, you're as old as Brady. <laughs> I don't know if I play that long, but uh, it is it is a, a true honor to play this game. Every single day I get a chance to suit up and play it. I feel, uh, I feel like it's a, it's a dream come true. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.